And uh, finally, I would like to introduce Mario Villanueva, who will be uh, speaking at this workshop on the topic of uh, more robust model predictive control and uh, set based uh, things. And uh, it's a one hour long workshop. You are welcome to ask questions during the talk. And please enjoy. And uh, Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is it one hour or 120? One twenty. But the yes. one hour is fine, probably. I think maybe. Um, all right. Well, first of all, thanks for coming. Um, it's early, you know. This is going to be a little bit dense. Um, please, at any point, if you have any questions, uh, just stop me. You can ask. I think I have something like twenty-five slides. The slides are dense, but still, you know, just uh, ask me questions. I will be glad to answer. So. Um, uh, as uh, was presented, my name is uh, Mario Villanueva. Um, I'm originally from Mexico, uh, but uh, now I'm working at the uh, Shanghai Tech University with uh, Boris Hoska. And um, well, I'm going to be talking about uh, model predictive control using um, set-based methods, robust model predictive control. Um, so first, uh, so let's start. We start with uh, some MPC. I think, uh, uh, well. Hopefully, everyone here uh, uh, understands the, the, the principles behind the MPC, but it, in a way, it's uh, relatively simple. Uh, so let's just look at this little airplane. We want to, to, to minimize the distance to the dotted line. Um, we have some dynamics, so it's a, a model-based methodology. So we have some, uh, a model for, for airplane and uh, for the constraints. So we want to avoid hitting this, uh, this uh, region over here. Uh, and it's a feedback uh, control. Uh, methodology. So how do we do this? Yeah. So essentially, we first wait for some measurement. Then we have an optimal control problem. Uh, in here, we have some uh, um, stage cost and some terminal cost in the general uh, setting. So we want to minimize with respect to the trajectories and the controls. We have uh, system dynamics over here. Uh, the first remark is I'm restricting the discussion to this kind of dynamics, which are affine on the, on the controls. I claim that this is enough for most practical purposes, uh, because even if it's nonlinear, you can always uh, bring it back to this form by um, adding some uh, auxiliary states and integrating the control once. Um, now, I'm going to be in here. We have some, uh, some parameters. Um, we have the. Um, so the initial value will be my current measurement, and I have some uh, inequality constraints here, and as well as some uh, uh, control bounds only. So I could uh, I could have some uh, uh, mixed state and control constraints, but I guess this one is a, it's a, a simple setting. So in here, this can be, for example, some uh, level set of uh, some inequality constraint, maybe some ellipsoid, some uh, bounds, some simple bounds, something. Then we solve this problem. We get a, um, an open loop control. We take the first, uh, uh, um, the first control, send it to, to the process, shift the horizon, and repeat. Can the capital G be also a function of the state? Yes, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned this one. Uh, yeah, in, in, in general, this can be a function of the states, but it's restricted in the way that it cannot be f a function of the parameters. So for all of the discussion in this uh, talk, uh, yeah, this can be a nonlinear function of the states if you want, but not of the parameters. Um, this one is just simple. Um, all right. So the problem with this is that more often than not, the uh, um, the value of the parameter is not exactly known. We have we have some other uncertainties. So in this way, for example, we can have some. Uh, some uh, wind, maybe I have considered already the model for the wind, but I do not exactly know the speed. Um, in general, maybe I just don't know exactly the parameters of my model. Uh, so which makes the system dynamics uh, uncertain, right? So my, my trajectory might be a, 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 different, a, a different realization, basically, um, which may lead to some uh, constraint violations. For some systems, this is fine. So uh, um, certainty equivalent or nominal MPC may be fine already for some, uh, for some applications. For some others, it may not. So I'm going to be discussing methods for uh, applications where it's not nice, it's not fine to have 
constraint violations. Um, now, the first way of doing robust model predictive control, and uh, perhaps the exact way of modeling this robust, uh, 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 the, the, the model predictive control problem, it's to have an exact worst case robust feedback formulation. Now, um, in a way, it's again a predictive control methodology, so it's an iterative process, which goes again the same. We take a measurement, and now we solve an optimal control problem. This one is quite different from the previous one, in the sense that now I'm uh, minimizing not over functions of time, but over functions of uh, both time and state. So these are feedback functions. So I'm optimizing the future feedbacks. Uh, and sorry, and um, I want to, in terms of my cost function, I may want to get my worst case cost. This is a, this is a modeling, somehow a modeling assumption, a modeling problem. Uh, this perhaps is not the most important. I could just want to, 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 to minimize a nominal trajectory or something like that. Right? I not, I, the, 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 the robustness is not necessarily about the cost function. It's more about the constraints. So I want to satisfy that the worst case constraint, so this is my robust formulation, uh, 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 satisfies the constraints. So for every, every realization of the, of the uncertain parameter, this constraint has to be uh, uh, satisfied. So in here, the notation that I'm using is um, this x is basically the solution of my dynamic system given an initial value and some feedback function and uh, 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 some parameters. So you can think of this as perhaps um, a numerical evaluation, if you want, of, your, of, your, of the solution of the dynamic system, or if you have it in closed form. Uh, 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 this, this is basically, this represents the solution for a given initial value at time t. For, in, for a given initial value, a given feedback, given future feedback function and uh, parameters. Um, so this is this would be the, the the exact robust feedback formulation. Now in here I take again the value of my feedback for the initial uh, initial time at the first time, send it to the process, shift the horizon, and repeat. So up to here we're fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, now in general, so this problem accounts for all possible realizations of the uncertainty, right? So I can guarantee that no constraint uh, will be violated as long as my parameters are assumed to lie in some set. So I need to assume something about my set, uh, about my, my uncertainties. In this case, I'm assuming that they are just bounded in some set. I know nothing else apart, apart from that. Um, now this, the main difference with, uh, with the nominal MPC is, uh, is that it optimizes over feedback controls instead of optimizing over open loop controls. And it is, unfortunately, intractable in general. It's, it's not that I can write this problem and just solve it numerically or something like that. Again, I'm optimizing over functions of the state and time. Right? If I could do this, then most of our problems in terms of uh, robustness would be solved. Uh, at least in the worst case, uh, in the worst case uh, uh, um, modeling paradigm. But uh, as I said, this is intractable in general. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be talking about how to handle, how to, to juggle with this complexity in order to arrive to formulations which are tractable, but um, uh, they, are still, uh, uh, they, they still have robustness guarantees. Now, one way of uh, doing um, robust uh, optimization or robust uh, optimal control, robust model predictive control. It's using the, 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 the so-called uh, scenario tree or multi-stage. Uh, there is a plenary tomorrow by Professor Engel, which I think is going to be about this one, so I'm not going to talk much about this. Uh, but the main idea is that I take my, my uncertainty set, I discretize it, so I pick some discrete values in this set, and these are my, my, my scenarios. Uh, it is a robust feedback control strategy because I'm looking ahead to, 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 what the possible, uh, um, to what the possible trajectories of my system could be for these scenarios. Uh, but compared to the min-max formulation, it's optimistic, right? Because I'm not accounting for all of the possible uh, realizations of my uncertainty. 
Um, now, this again, it's uh, intractable in the sense that uh, that is, it has an exponential number of scenarios. There are some clever ways of uh, of uh, of dealing with this uh, of dealing with this exponential growth of of uh, of, of the scenarios. And I guess uh, Professor Engel will be talking about this uh, tomorrow. We already had also some talks about this yesterday. Um, but again, the main problem that I have with this is the fact that it's it's not robust per se, right? So there could be uncertainties. There could be there could be an uncertainty that I did not account for, which causes my constraint to be violated, which is something I don't want, right? Now, so uh, as I said in this talk, I'm going to be talking about methods to 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 deal with this uh, uh, with this problem of uh, robust feedback control. And what do I want from my methods? I want them to to account for all uncertainty realiz realizations in my given bounds, my given set, and um, should be computationally tractable compared to, to, to the min max. Um, this is my wish list. And uh, so the way that, that I deal with this, it's using set-based methods. So instead of discretizing my um, this, instead of discretizing the uncertainty, I propagate it through time. So this is the, the basis of the set-based methods. So take a method and then propagate the uncertainty through the dynamic system. And uh, um, there are several ways of doing this. And uh, this is what I will be talking about in the, in the, in the rest of the, of the talk. Now, uh, let's look at some, you know, I, I think that we have a lot of chemical engineers here. No? Yeah, maybe. Well, if not, this is a a a, um, a uh, process in, uh, engineering example. So I have a fed batch process, which means I have my tank, and then I'm going to be feeding it something. Right? Nothing comes out. Something comes in. I have an exothermic reaction, which is uh, I have a component A plus a component B. They react to form C, and it's ex exothermic because it produces heat. Now, uh, I have some modeling, uh, um, some, uh, modeling assumptions here. So basically, I have some um, initial amount of A in the, in, the, in the reactor, so some volume already. And then I'm going to be feeding A at a given concentration, which is given by, uh, by the number of moles here and, uh, and the, 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 well, the, the volume that I have in my feeding tank. Oh, yeah, sorry. This has to be B. Mistake here. So yeah, I'm feeding B, and this B is uh, coming from a tank which is at a given concentration. Um, I'm going to be modeling the molar conversion, which is basically the amount of, of uh, the amount of A that is being converted into into C. Um, and in terms of, of um, in terms of uh, of the of the dynamic model, so basically my states are going to be my conversion, the the volume, the temperature. And my reaction rate, it's basically uh, um, mass action kinetics. So I just, uh, I just have a, a, a product of my, of my components here, uh, A and B, of the amounts of A and the amount of B. Um, now, I have here the dynamics of the temperature. Um, so basically, the, the temperature change has to do with the, with the heat that is produced by the reaction. Then also, I mean, my components are entering at some concentration here, which affects the temperature of the, of the reaction mixture. And um, I have, in order to remove heat, I have a cooling jacket that is at a, at a given temperature, right? So in terms of controls, the only thing that I have is my feeding rate. Now, um, in this, uh, for this, for this reactor, in terms of control, in, in terms, in terms of uh, constraints, I'm going to have some uh, control bounds, and I will have some um, a safety constraint here. So, what the safety constraint means is that uh, basically the temperature under cooling failure. So, I want that if my cooling fails, I want the temperature of my reactor, uh, my reaction mixture, to be less than some uh, uh, given upper bound. Now, um, the solution for this reactor is basically that the more A I fit, 
sorry, the more BI feed, the more A reacts, and then the more CI produce. But this also produces the most heat, right? So the most increase in the temperature. Now, if my cooling fails, at that moment, I need to stop my, the operation of my reactor. But still, since there is, there is still some, uh, some A and B in the tank which is unreacted, then the, 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 the temperature will keep increasing, even if, I, even if I stop the operation of the reactor, right? So this is basically what this constraint, uh, what this constraint here is, is, is modeling. Right? I want that even if my cooling fails and I stop my reactor, I want to be able to guarantee that the, 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 well, the reactor won't explode if you want. The temperature won't increase uh, more than what I'm, uh, more, more uh, than what I uh, designed my reactor for, for example. Okay, sorry, but I'm going to take these constraints like a normal constraint, I mean, inside the formulation of the MPC. I don't know see why I have to take it like a, a different constraint from the normal regulation. I mean, you have some object function mm -hmm. subject to uh -huh. constraint. Uh -huh. It should be like this. I mean, I, I don't understand what's the difference between safety constraint and normal constraint. All right. Well, this is just a safety constraint. The safety constraint is a normal constraint, if you want, right? That's that, that's fine. But the whole point about this is basically that in my in my MPC, I'm going to assume that I know all of the parameters of my of my uh, of my model. I'm going to assume that I know everything. To I have perfect knowledge about everything, which in reality I may not have, or most likely I don't have, right? So my optimizer will try to to optimize for something which may create, if, uh, if, the true, if the true value of the parameter is different from the one that, I'm, that my controller or that my formulation knows, then I may have constraint violations. In this case, I'm assuming that the, the, the reaction rate and the reaction enthalpy here, these are um, uh, uncertain. I just have bounds for this, right? So the whole point of this is, is yes, it's, it's a normal constraint, but what happens or how do you deal with this if you have uncertainties, if you don't have perfect knowledge of your model and you want to guarantee something, right? Now, um, here I'm just basically showing this uh, uh, blue line over here. Oh, that's blue, yeah. Uh, this blue line over here basically shows uh, um, my, my molar conversion, right? Which is uh, the objective of my controller. I want to maximize the conversion in order to get the most C, right? So, um, now, from this, um, I did, I'm not showing the control profiles, but basically, uh, as I said, what happens is that I, uh, initially I feed a lot of B, right? Until uh, my only constraint basically uh, uh, gets, uh, uh, it becomes active, and at this point I start, I start feeding less and less and less, right? Until I keep it at a, at a, at a constant, if you want. Now, this is for this trajectory over here. It's for the nominal value of my parameters. So I just gave, I have some bounds for my parameters. Then I take one to be the nominal, just maybe in the middle of my bounds. Uh, I feed it to my, to, my, to my controller. So I design my controller, my MPC controller, based on this value of this parameter. And, um, and then I basically just do closed loop. Over here, I don't, have, I don't have any process. I'm assuming I don't have any process noise. I'm assuming that the only error comes from the parameters, from the uncertain parameters. Now, this line over here is already if I take uh, um, my nominal value of my reaction rate uh, 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 plus a 10% increase. And my nominal value of the enthalpy minus a 10% increase, right? So in this case, I'm assuming that my process actually has different values than the ones that I'm giving to my controller. So my controller thinks that it's still fine to keep increasing the, the to, to keep feeding, right? Because he doesn't, the, the controller does not know what the true value of the parameter is. And then, well, this causes a, a, a constraint, a, the constraint to be violated. So in this case, my reactor would explode. And this shaded gray area is basically uh, if I take um, ar around my nominal values of the parameters, I take a 30% uh, um, error, basically. 
And well, in most cases, I would have basically, my controller would become infeasible, so I, have, I would have constraint violations. So this is the whole point of why. I mean, you have, yes, you have a normal constraint in here. It's, it's just called a safety constraint, but this, this one is critical for the process in a way, right? Can you go with the back slide? Can I just add in Tmax the bound? The, the, the bound over here, the Tmax is this one. Uh, but I know what is the noise, possible noise, so uh -huh. I add to this Tmax the maximum bound error. So, uh, I mean, the, there is a difference, you know, that is, you don't know anything about the error. Yeah, so that's the, the thing. I mean, so so in a way, I won't have I won't have so my trajectories won't be just one line, right? So I need to consider all possible trajectories, uh, uh, all, all possible trajectories for my, um, for example, over here, you know, the the delta h, so 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 the the um, the enthalpy center in here. So it's basically I don't have just one trajectory for this. I have a an infinite number of trajectories which are generated by all my possible my infinite possibilities of my uncertainties, right? I don't have discrete values. So with uh, multi-stage, you would assume that you have some scenarios of your uncertainties, of your parameters. Let's take just the bounds and the middle, right? The upper, the middle, the lower, and then I would have three trajectories, right? This would be my three, my, my three possible scenarios. But what happens if you are actually in between? You are not accounting uh, uh, for this. Um, so, <coughs> As I said, uh, the rest of the talk is it, it, it's about how how we deal with these kind of things. Like how how can we guarantee that uh, uh, no constraints will be violated? Um, so we're going to start with open loop, right? So I'm I'm going I'm going to start with something that does not account with the fact that I will be able to optimize in the future, right? So I'm going to start with open loop reachability. I have a dynamic system over here, so this is my dynamic system. I know my initial conditions, and I have my uncertain parameters within some bounds, some set. And the first object that I'm going to present you with, it's a, a, a so-called reachable set. So if I give you a control function, an open loop control function of time that maps from time to, uh, to, to, to the control bounds, uh, I get this beautiful thing over here called the reachable set which essentially tells me what is the value of my states at time t. So it includes all the possible states at time t, uh, which are generated by this control and by all the possible realizations of the uncertainty. Right? This, is, this, this somehow is the central object behind everything. So I would like you to take a look at this and then, uh, 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 and then tell me whether you know, there is something that, that you don't get. So uh, the definition, I mean, looks, looks a little bit scary, but it's, it's really not. The only thing that it's telling me is that for, uh, I'm, I'm looking for all the possible solutions of my ODE, for all the possible solutions of my, so, so for, uh, for all my parameters, which are within this uh, given bounds, which start from my initial condition, and then basically I want the values of the states at time t. That's, that's basically, this is my reachable set. So it's the set of all states that can be reached from a given point by a given controller for every possible realization of the uncertainty. Yeah? Uh, this is, this is uh, basically what I would have if I have a two-dimensional system. Um, then basically I have, I start from here and then I take all of my, all of my trajectories and they can be at a time t, they can reach a, a, all points in this set, right? Uh, now, so yeah, sorry. So the, the inputs that you use to move to the set, mm -hmm. so are some input gen generated by your open loop control? So in this case, the so the open loop control is given, right? So I, I give you this, uh, right? Uh, so the set corresponds to like one Let's one control, control, one control, control yes. Input project. Yeah, to be, to be precise here, I mean, this reachable set depends uh, I mean, I would have to, to really write the dependency with respect to this set here, to the initial condition, and to the, to the, val to the, to the u. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is, uh, okay. this is uh, very good, yeah. Uh, so for one given u, then basically uh, uh, all, the possible real uh, all the possible trajectories that can be realized for, uh, for the values in this, on in, in this set, for the values of the uncertainty in this set. Yeah, so we take a simple 
nonlinear ODE over here. Uh, two states. Um, if I have my, so this is just one parameter, and my initial condition is just equal to, to, to my parameter, just 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Then I would take my favorite uh, integrator, simulate it forward in, in uh, time. This has no controls, so it's the simplest thing you can have. Um, and then I would get this, uh, this trajectory over here, right? But now basically what happens if I tell you that you need to consider all initial conditions basically in this uh, in a given uh, in a given ball centered at 0 0.5 yeah for all values of my parameters uh, um, for all values of my parameters uh, in, in this ball basically so what I would need to have it's uh, in here this is uh, uh, this is my reachable sets at different times right so this is just the boundary of what what we call the the reachable tube the reachable tube is just the union in time of all of these reachable sets mm -hmm. right in this case, it's, it's relatively easy because I can show that not trajectory will be, if I, I, I can just basically take the, the points in the boundary of this ball and then just form, uh, uh, simulate it forward in time. And uh, then basically uh, uh, for, this, for this very specific ODE, you can guarantee that if you take any other trajectory inside of the, of the ball over here of initial conditions, it will not cross, right? So it's, it's simple. I can just take the boundary points and then just simulate forward the boundary trajectories. In general, this is not possible. Um, so, um, so basically, which leads me to the first uh, thing that I must be able to do, which is compute bounds for my for my for my uh, uh, reachable sets. Now, what are the challenges? Is that in general, the reachable set for a, for for this kind of ODEs can be any set. The only requirement is that it's, it's, or the only characteristic I know about this is that it has to be connected, uh, may not be compact, uh, so it can be almost anything, right? Uh, in general, I have no closed form expression for the, for the ODE solution, so it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to compute in general. Um, so what do I do? Then I can consider some sets which are bounders basically for this, uh, for, this, for this reachable set. So basically, since we cannot compute this exactly, uh, the next best, best thing is to compute uh, outer approximations, right? Because then I can guarantee that uh, if, I, if I know that, uh, that the set is an outer approximation of my reachable set, then I can guarantee that all trajectories will be inside of this outer approximation, right? So I can make some guarantees related to this. Um, well, these sets, I can choose whichever parameterization I want. I can say, right, I want to, I want to look at non-convex sets. I, I want to look at convex sets. I want to look at uh, hyperboxes, at intervals, at polytopes, at whatever I want, right? Uh, for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, ellipsoidal outer approximations. So, in general, about convex outer approximations, in particular, about um, about ellipsoidal sets. Now, this is not new. There are a lot of people have been doing reachability analysis. You, this is a very well established uh, field in uh, in uh, in control, right? So, there are many ways of of of, uh, of doing reachability analysis. So one, one thing is it comes uh, basically from the validated computing uh, um, community, right? These are called uh, discrete time set valued integrations. So what happens is, uh, in general, I take my ODE and then I discretize it. And then basically I use set arithmetics just to propagate sets forwards in time. So I can compute, um, I can uh, take, for example, uh, construct Taylor approximations in time of the solutions of my ODEs, right? And then I can just uh, propagate sets through these Taylor approximations. Um, there are a lot of people who have been doing this, mostly uh, uh, in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, considering rounding errors for, for, uh, for, um, for dynamic systems, basically for, for integration of dynamic system. Um, we have also continuous time set valued integration, which is uh, which has been dealt with by a lot of authors as well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the particulars of these uh, of these kind of methods. This is in particular the one 
the kind of method that I will be uh, talking about. Um, you can also construct a, a, um, um, a polyhedral or, or um, linear matrix inequality relaxations. Um, and of course, you can represent uh, these reachable sets uh, using uh, solutions of uh, uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equations. Now, um, the kind of method that, that I, I, I work with mostly is uh, basically continuous time set propagation. For, for this thing, for, for these kind of methods, what I'm looking for is to construct an auxiliary system of, uh, of differential inequalities whose solutions describe the outer approximations of the reachable set of the original dynamic system. So, in a way, what I'm looking is sufficient conditions. So, if I said, if I say, look, now I have a set-valued function, right, which is a function that takes time as an argument and then returns a set. If I have a set-valued function, I'm looking for pointwise in time, sufficient conditions such that I know that it will be for all time an enclosure of my reachable set. This is the, the whole idea behind continuous time uh, uh, set propagation. And, uh, and of course, the trick is how do I construct sufficient conditions? So if, I, if you give me a set valid function, how do I construct these sufficient conditions? And then how do I implement them in practice? Um, the first thing I need to do is somehow choose my class of, my class of set valid functions, right? It is very difficult just to say it's, it's as difficult as as difficult as computing the, the, the exact reachable set, it's to try to construct sufficient conditions for uh, uh, general set-valued functions, right? So in this case, I'm just going to be focusing on convex set-valued functions. But even if I say I'm going to restrict my search or I'm going to restrict the, the, the class of function that I'm going to be looking at to, to, to um, to those that have convex values, how would I even represent them? How would I parameterize them? How would I store them in, the compute, in a computer, for example, if I wanted to do something practical with this? So, so the first, so the first uh, thing that I have to do is, is somehow choose a parameterization, or so choose a way to represent my, my, uh, my, uh, 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 my set values functions and their, and their values in time, pointwise in time. Now we're gonna go a little bit back to uh, convex optimization and convex analysis. And uh, the, best, the best way to try to understand this kind of thing is to looking at, at, at particular examples of convex sets. Um, first, we have uh, ellipsoids, which is just a, a sublevel set of a quadratic function. So I have here, this is a positive, uh, a positive semi-definite matrix. Uh, this would be the center of my ellipsoid, and this would describe uh, the shape matrix of my, of my ellipsoid, right? So this, this matrix en encodes basically the directions, and uh, so the, the rotation and the, and the length of, my, of, of, of the semi-axis of my, of my ellipsoids. So this is one way of representing it um, as a sublevel set of a quadratic function. An equivalent way, it's uh, uh, to represent it as an affine transformation of a unit circle, right? This affine transformation is again defined by, by, by this, by this uh, funny square root here of, uh, of, my, of my matrix Q. So this is the positive semi-definite uh, square root of the matrix, right? So I can go, as long as, the, as long as the matrix is invertible, I can go from this to this representation, uh, and, this, and these are equivalent. If the matrix is not invertible, if I have, uh, if I have basically the generated ellipsoids, then, uh, then these two are not equivalent, and I'd much rather use this one, this representation, right? Um, now, the next object that I'm going to be using quite a lot, it's the support function, which is defined for any convex set. What is a support function? So um, I have it over here. It's just basically, um, if I take a vector C, in this case, I'm just going to restrict myself to, 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 to unit vectors. If I take a vector C, then I maximize this linear function, the C transpose X, over my, over my set, right? So you can imagine this as, as, as just taking this. This is the, basically the gradient of my linear function. 
then I just move uh, uh, lines which are uh, orthogonal to this vector until they touch some point in my, in my ellipsoid, which is basically, this would be a, a supporting hyperplane, right? So um, this would be the contour of my, of, my, of my cost function in the direction C, of my linear function in the direction C, and then this is basically the point at which, uh, at which this function is being maximized over the set. This, this, uh, this is called a supporting, uh, a supporting hyperplane. Right? This line is, is called a supporting hyperplane. And, um, and basically, one of the things, this is defined for any convex set. But uh, a, a very nice thing about the ellipsoids is that I can actually compute, I can actually construct an explicit, uh, an explicit uh, a closed form expression for this, uh, for this uh, uh, support function. If I had, for example, I could define this for a, for a, a polytope, so for the intersection of a, for the intersection of some linear constraints, but then this this would be defined as a as a parametrically as a solution of a of a of a linear program, right? As a function of c, basically, I would need to to solve this uh, this parametric optimization problem uh, problem. But in this case, I basically I can just construct it explicitly. I can solve this problem explicitly and then just uh, and then just uh, take this. Now, why are these uh, support functions important? Several things. First one. The support function represents the distance, the sign distance from the origin to, uh, to, the, to the supporting hyperplane, which is defined basically by, uh, by this linear function over here, right? Um, second thing, if I, take, if I take this hyperplane, then basically take everything that's below, I have a supporting half space, which is a convex set, Again, that, that I know that includes every point in my, in my ellipsoid. Uh, and again, I've been talking about how to parameterize and how to represent sets. So if I take different values of C, right? So for every C, basically, I, have, I, I can evaluate this function. And then I can, I can construct my supporting hyper, hyperplane in this direction, and then I can take my, uh, the house space that it defines, right? And then I move it again, then I choose another C, another C, another C, another C, basically. Another C, as you can see, it's, it's, it's basically representing points in the boundary of the, uh, so, so this hyperplane is representing points on the boundary of the, of the ellipsoid. Um, and if I evaluate this for all uh, uh, unit vectors, and I take the intersection of all of these uh, uh, house spaces, then I can uniquely define, so the, then the, the, the support function uniquely defines my, uh, my, my, my ellipsoid. And this is true for, uh, for any convex set, right? So if I choose support functions, I can parameterize convex sets. Am I clear in that? Yeah? Yes? Um, I have a small question about the skew matrix. Yes. Does this formula work even if q is uh, non invertible or is no, no, it, it it also works. It also works if it's uh, if it's basically non-invertible. I mean, you can uh, you can uh, make an argument here and take uh, take some limit basically, and and um, and yes, you will. Uh, this this formula this formula also also holds for for the for the case where this is not. So I mean, you see over here there is no there is no inverse, right? So this uh, you can you can basically show this formula for both for the for the invertible case and for the. For the non-invertible case, uh, Q is a covariance matrix. Q is like yes, basically Q is a, Q is a co the, the, I mean, you could you could think of this as a as a, as a covariance matrix. Why do I need the supporting half space with mm, the support function when I have the ellipsoid and the ellipsoid is a convex set? So why should I need use the support of one convex set if I have a convex set? Why should you use? So it is, it's just basically different ways of parameterizing the same set, right? Now, in some some parameterizations are easy to easier to work with than others. This is just an example that I'm showing with the ellipsoid, right? Okay. But basically, it's just to show that I can parameterize any convex set by by uh, uh, by its support function, right? So, or or at, by the half spaces that are induced by the support function. And uh, I'm talking about support functions because 
basically, I'm going to use it next. As I said, the first step that I needed in order to construct enclosures, right, is to restrict my, 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 myself to a certain class of set valued functions. So to, 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 to restrict myself to, to, to have these functions, uh, you know, with a, their, their cross sections within a, within a certain class of, uh, of, uh, of sets. I first said, like, look, non convex are too difficult. Let's just, uh, uh, um, let's just look at, uh, at convex, right? And then, in particular, something which is even easier to work with are ellipsoids. Okay. Now, um, this is a bit of a heavy slide, but it's somehow uh, um, uh, the basis of uh, most, uh, or at least most methods that I use for, for, uh, for reachability analysis. As I said, first, I restrict myself to a given class of set-valued functions, and then, and then I need to find sufficient conditions such that I know that if these are satisfied, I will have an enclosure of my reachable set. Um, and then, this is somehow my sufficient condition. Yes, it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, let, me, let me go line by line trying to explain this. So if I have a set valued function y, and it satisfies for all time this differential inequality. This differential inequality is expressed in terms of the time derivative of the support function, right, of my set. And then this has to be larger than this set over here. What is this set? First, uh, I used, I mean, it just didn't really fit, but I used a shorthand notation here to just uh, define my, my, my right hand side. In this case, uh, this is, remember that this is open loop reachability, so I give you a u. U is fixed, given, that's it. Um, so this is basically my right hand side. And, um, and basically these lines, if you, if you look at this, this, uh, this is basically the supporting, uh, the supporting hyperplane in the direction C of, uh, of my convex set. And then basically if I take these two constraints together, I'm asking to the supporting point. So all the points that are in the supporting hyperplane that are also in the, in the set, which are basically attained at the boundary of the set. So I'm looking at boundary points in the set. And then I'm just also looking at all of the, all of the possible values of my, of my uncertainty. So what this set is, is basically all of the possible values that the right-hand side of my ODE can take right, for every value of the state in the boundary of the current set and all of the values of my uncertainty. It's a little bit difficult to, to, to imagine, but if you think of, if you think of the right-hand side of the ODE as, uh, as, as basically being the tangents of, of the curves of my, of my ODE at a given point, right? So basically what I'm trying to say here is if I, this is the set of all slopes in time, right, of all possible tangent lines that I can take in the boundary of my, of my, of my tube at a given point. And if this is smaller, basically, than the time derivative of the support function of this set, right, so if I basically, if, if this grows smaller than the, than the time derivative of the support function, then basically I will know that for all times I will, I will be always overestimating my, my reachable set. This is the, the, the intuition behind this condition, right? So I'm, I'm just looking, I'm just saying that it's enough to look at boundary points, and of course all points on the, on the uncertainty. So in order to, to, to be able to, to make sure that I can have, I can have an enclosure for, for this. So these are my sufficient conditions after I've chosen my parameterization. Yeah, but here the C is like the points on your units. Of yes. And um, if you want to uh, guarantee your set is like a subset of the right hand side of the ODE, then you have to pay for infinite points on the unit circuit. Yes, sure. But uh, if you take infinite points, then the problem becomes intractable, right? If I, I take, take an infinite amount of points, points the problem becomes intractable, yes. No, I haven't. Okay. I haven't solved this problem. The whole, this whole, the whole, the whole, the whole thing of the, behind this talk is to try to, 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 to juggle with the complexity, right? 
So you have a very complex problem, and then you start seeing what can I do with this, right? In a way, the problem that I have solved over here is to, if I have a restricted class of set valued functions, right? I can tell you whether or not this will be an enclosure of my reachable set, right? I never said that this is, uh, that this is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, tractable at this point. Now, um, let's, let's just basically try to look at a very specific case, which is uh, ellipsoids. Because as I, as I said, now I started with a general class of sets, then I went into convex sets, and now if I pick a very specific uh, element of this class, which is ellipsoids, maybe I can say something more, right? So that is the, 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 the basically juggling with the, with the complexity. So if you, if you remember this, uh, this figure, so let's try to look for ellipsoids, how do these, uh, how do these conditions uh, look like? So the first thing, so uh, I'm just gonna, as I said, restrict myself to have functions whose cross sections are ellipsoids. I can take any of the definitions. I just wrote this one here because it's useful for this case. Uh, I'm going to also restrict my uncertainty to be in an ellipsoid. So I will know, uh, I will know basically the, the, the center of my ellipsoid. Uh, for, for the uncertainty and some shape matrix as well, right? So everything are, is ellipsoids here. Now the first thing that I, that I can do, it's basically I know that I can replace this by, I, I, I know the value of the support function. So uh, sorry, I know the, uh, the closed form of the support function, so I can replace it over here, right? And then I can replace my general constraints by ellipsoids, and this already looks a little bit uh, less abstract. Now, next thing that I know, if I know the value, so if I know a closed form expression for my support function of the ellipsoids, I can also compute the time derivative of this, right? So I can replace the, the, the left-hand side of this inequality by, uh, uh, by, this, uh, by this expression, right? Um, I know for all of this uh, cues, but you have a square root of the Q matrix, right? Yeah. The square root is not always unique, so you're okay like, like just like that's positive definite. Which which? Uh, so the Q, Q, yeah, let's assume for a, for a minute that is uh, that is uh, positive uh, that is positive definite. Yeah, but right, the so. matrix can like you can have many possibilities of the Q square root, right? Q of E from matrix. No. So, but the square root of a matrix is like. Uh, no, you have the, the if your matrix is positive definite, you have a unique positive definite square root, right? So, so in that sense, I mean, I have just, if, if the matrix is, uh, if the ellipsoid is degenerate, right, then yes, I can have, uh, I can have many. So, so degeneracy brings me problems in this case. And it's still valid. Everything that I'm saying here is still valid for, for, for degenerate cases, but uh, you need to take limits and things like that at some point. So, so but, but in this case, I mean, the, the, the square root, so this is based, by the way, this is not the square root of a matrix, right? So this is a square, this is a scalar. Because you have uh, C transpose Q, see? C is a vector, and so, so this is a scalar. Now this is square root, this is a matrix square root. Yeah, ah, so that's the one that you, yeah. that you, that you meant. Yeah, this one, this one if, if you're positive definite, this, this, this one is a unique positive definite square root. Um, now, next thing that I can do, uh, it's I can take advantage of, of uh, of basically knowing some of the of the geometry of my set, right? Um, as I said, these two constraints basically define the points which are both in this supporting hyperplane and in the set as well. And in the case of, of, of ellipsoids, then basically this point is unique, right? So if you can see, I mean, there's this, this hyperplane is tangent to the ellipsoid, and this would be basically the point. So I can replace these two constraints by a single point, right? Which is basically given by this. That's why I, I, I wrote this, this definition this way. Why? Because if I take unit vectors, uh, which are in the, so if I take vectors which are the, in, the unit, in the unit circle, so then basically this ellipsoid, I can you know, just remember that this is just the, the, the affine transformation of my unit circle. So if I take just points in the boundary, then I know that the boundary points Will be uh, in the uh, will be a boundary point of the ellipsoid. So for a given vector c, for a given vector c, basically I can compute 
the vector in the boundary, uh, for a given boundary point in the unit circle, in the unit sphere, I can compute the corresponding uh, 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 point in the boundary of the ellipsoid, which is uh, um, obtained by doing this affine transformation. Right? You can also, basically, another, another way that you can do is you can, uh, yeah, it, it's just basically the maximizer of the, of, the, of the support function. So you can also compute it by hand, some duality and stuff like that, and then you will get to the same, to the same basically to the same expression. Right? The message here is that for, for ellipsoids, basically, these two constraints is just a singleton, it's just one point. Now, uh, the funny thing is that this is not only valid for ellipsoids, as long as I have certain boundary structure of my convex set. So if I, if I restrict myself to, uh, to sets which are strictly convex uh, and that have uh, um, positive curvature in the boundary, so basically that have no, no facets, then this, uh, this point for, for, for every C, this point basically will be unique. So the, the way somehow that we, that, that we proved this, uh, this thing was going first Again, managing complexity, complexity, saying, look, let's just look at, 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 uh, at sets that have a certain boundary structure, and then basically take the limit. Um, uh, approximate the sets, and then take, take basically take a limit. And somehow this is, this is valid for any convex set, even if they have facets or not. Um, now, I can, this is just, again, it's just a linear program. Well, no, not, not really a linear program, but uh, I can basically expand this. Uh, this is a, sorry, this is a support function, so I can just basically expand this side, and then what I get is, uh, is this, right? So, as I said, I'm looking for points in the state which are in the boundary of the ellipsoid, and as I said, this point is unique, so I get rid of my, of my, of my constraints for, 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 the, for the state, and then basically I just have, I just have constraints on my parameter, this term is basically, uh, it's just constant, right? It's just a constant offset because the u is given. Okay? Yeah, sorry, no, this uh, should. No, this is for a given c. This is for a given c. So remember that, that uh, as Shakti was, uh, was uh, mentioning before. Huh? It's only on p, yes. And this is, this is basically for a given C, and I need to check this for every possible C, which is still intractable, right? But at least, you know, I, I, I got to something that looks mildly decent. So uh, basically, let's say we can try to go a little bit step by step, just to more or less show. I use properties, again, we use properties of, uh, of, uh, of uh, of the ellipsoid of the po uh, positive semi-definite uh, uh, um, se positive semi-definiteness semi of the shape matrix, um, to get rid of all of this, uh, the first thing that I can do is if I look at this structure, is basically that I have some sort of separation between uh, between my central path and my shape matrix, right? So I have terms that are belong both to the. So sorry, I have I have a. Uh, um, I have uh, a separation between my, my terms that are in the for the um, for the central path and the terms that are for my for my shape matrix. So let's I will postulate that my state is split in between uh, is split uh, into a nominal part and a disturbed part, right? This is the first thing, and this is just a, a, a postulate basically. Uh, and then I can, I will say that this central path, so that this nominal part, will satisfy the dynamics for the nominal value of my parameter. Again, this is uh, this is uh, this is basically a, a, a postulate, um, which it's not unreasonable if I first restrict myself to. Um, to basically uh, 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 systems which are uh, which are linear. So le let's just basically look at systems which are linear. So let's take this to be uh, just a linear function of the state and the parameter. Uh, so in that case, I can use superposition principle and basically just split into the nominal and the and the disturbed part. Uh, these are details that uh, that to be honest, I mean, it's, uh, it's these are just parts of the proof and the construction. So I just really don't want to go through all of the technical details. I just want to give a little bit of a hint on how this, 
happens, right? How, how you magically jump from something that has C to something that doesn't have any C. Um, now, if I, as I said, if I take, if I restrict myself to systems which are linear, then I can basically, um, I, I get this expression for my, uh, I can, again, I can split this into, into the, no, I, I'm splitting this into the nominal and the disturbed part. Here, this is my, my linear matrix. I don't know why it's not here. I thought I, I, I've written this. But, um, but anyway, after doing some algebraic manipulations, you, you somehow get into, into an expression that looks like this. Right? Now, um, this expression over here has new terms. This is a degree of freedom. So you can think of this as of adding the support functions of two ellipsoids. Right? The first ellipsoid is basically taking a linear transformation of my states. The second ellipsoid is just basically taking the, the adding the, the, the uncertainty, basically. Right? So I transform, I know that my, ellip, my uncertainty is, is, a, is an ellip, in an ellipsoid with a shape matrix P. Then I just basically apply a, 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 a linear transformation on this. And then I'm basically just adding two ellipsoids together. The sum of two ellipsoids is not an ellipsoid anymore. So ellipsoids are not close, are, are not close under addition. Uh, so what do I do? I bound it again with an ellipsoid, right? To keep myself in the class of sets. Now this, uh, this bounding is not unique. Uh, I can get, if I, get, if I have two ellipsoids, I, I add, them, add them together. This will be convex. This will look somehow like a convex potato. And um, I want to take a, an ellipsoidal bounder of this. And then I have some degrees of freedom of, of choosing how tight I want, to, I want it to be. You can think of this as trying to think like, all right, so I want may, maybe the minimal volume or the minimum trace or in this case, I just choose a parameterized family of ellipsoids, and then uh, and then just allow this to be an extra degree of freedom for the for the optimizer to choose. Why should I care about what whether my whether this ellipsoid is tight in this sense or not? At the end of the day, I'm trying to solve an, a, a control problem, right? So if I have more controls, why not? Um, now, if you look at this, I, I basically have a some quadratic form. And then using properties of basically positive semi-definite matrices, I can get rid of, uh, of the vector C in order to get some differential equation for the, or a differential inequality for the, for the, for the shape matrix, right? This I can turn into an equality. And then basically if I have linear systems, I have both a differential equation that describes the center of my ellipsoidal tube, if you want, and the shape matrix. OK? Now, what happens if I have nonlinear systems? Uh, the dirty trick over here is to split the, the nonlinear non function into the sum of a, of a linear and a nonlinear part, and then basically do the same stuff, the same trick, and then consider this as an extra uncertainty. Yeah, simple, fine. Uh, of course, you know, there are many ways of building these nonlinearity estimates. You want certain properties of these. You want them to at least be uh, 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 tight in some sense. Um, depending on what you want to do with this, you may want to, 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 to bound higher order terms. You know, second order, uh, second order are sufficient. So if I basically, if I manage to just construct a bounder for the, for the second order terms over here, I'm, I'm fine. Maybe I'm not completely sure, yes. but you are adding a new control action, in this case it should be lambda, right? Mm -hmm. So you have more control over the system. Mm -hmm. But in the same way that you add lambda, you need to add some constraint for lambda. Yeah. So your your The only constraint that I have on lambda is that it has to be uh, it has to be uh, positive. No, it just has to be positive. That's the only constraint on, on, on lambda basically. And again, this is part of the it's just, it's, it's part of the derivation. Now, this whole thing of uh, this whole derivation, basically, of the ellipsoidal. So you can get you can get exactly the same exactly the same uh, uh, um, the same equation. So people got this many years ago. Kurchansky from the old Russian 
uh, uh, control literature, you can you can find the ellipsoidal uh, ellipsoidal boundaries for this uh, for this thing. Mostly the contribution that I had uh, that I had in this uh, in this uh, journal of global optimization paper was to to generalize these conditions basically to um, to, to to general convex sets. So you can do you can get the same kind of formulas, for example, if you do intervals interval boxes, uh, um, and then basically the existing bounding techniques they um, they are subsumed by this uh, 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 differential inequality. So um, and uh, yeah, well, I mean, at this point now, you have you have conditions which you can compute. Yeah. For the, uh, you said that the nonlinearity is transformed to some uncertainty. Yeah. How do, you, how do you calculate the, I, I guess, the Omega matrix, like from some nonlinear functions? <laughs> that is a question. I, I, let me let me try to go this uh, over this. Uh, um, um, I have I think I have some slides at the end about about this. Um, uh -huh. There are different ways of doing this. If you're just interested in reachability, for example, right? If you don't want to optimize anything, you don't want to do control, for example, um, you, can use, um, you can use interval arithmetics, for example. I don't know if you're familiar with interval arithmetics, no? It's a way, basically, if you have a function, and if I give you, it's a, it, if I have a function, um, you can decompose this function in the computer into a, if it, this function is factorable, I can decompose it into, into factors, into a finite number of factors, and then I can propagate. So if I know bounds for, interval bounds for one of the variables, I can propagate, it, propagate them through the, through, the, through the atoms, basically. The main problem about this is that, uh, in general, this is, uh, with respect to the bounds, it's only Lipschitz continuous and not differentiable. So I wouldn't be able to use it in, mm -hmm. in control. Another way of doing this is I can, take, so um, I can take um, uh, the Hessian, right, and construct bounds of the Hessian in a, given, in a given operational region if you want, right? So if I have constraints, I can construct bounds on the Hessian, uh, bounds on the Frobenius norm for the, for the Hessian, sorry, and then I can, I can, uh, I can construct an, an over approximation of this nonlinearity. You can also use, you can do the same if, uh, uh, for this, you would use also interval arithmetics. There are there are many different packages basically to 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 try to do to try to do validated computing. It's called or set based computing. This is uh, I mean I'm sorry I mean this is this is a, a whole different talk basically of how to do this automatically. You can also do it by hand. <laughs> you you like I mean to be honest I mean the the, the case studies that that uh, most of the case studies that uh, that uh, that uh, we've had in this uh, in these papers. Uh, they're basically just uh, computed by hand. At some point, it becomes very cumbersome. But the, the general idea is, is, is again to get uh, to basically bound the difference between the, the function and the and the and the linear approximation, right? Try to get rid of all of the constant and the linear terms until your boundaries. You only get quadratic terms, and then try to infer from uh, from um, try to use basically the bounds that you have on the variables in order to 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 over approximate basically. Yeah. So using some inequalities and things like that. Um, um, we've had some very big case studies uh, and the way, uh, another kind of like cheap and dirty way of doing this, it's uh, first, consider, first consider just the linear approximation, then try to construct the uh, reachable tubes for this, for this, uh, um, for this um, linear approximation. Uh, and then kind of explode the bounds Right, and then compute Hessian bounds at every time instant for the so so allow the integrator to compute Hessian bounds at every time instant for the for the non for the in order to to, to compute the nonlinearities basically, and then the controller will take care of uh, of trying to decrease the conservatism. So I'll I'll, I'll, I'll we can talk about this a, a, a little bit uh, so more as well. So understand it correctly. <laughs> you have a nonlinear system without any linear part. You will just take the linearization and go through. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in general, I mean, this, this basically, this, these uh, theorems are, are uh, it, it doesn't have to be, a, I can take a linearization at the central path, for example, or I can take any, this can be any, any two matrices. 
uh, as long as basically my nonlinearity bounder satisfies this condition, right? It doesn't have to be a linearization at the, at the, at the central path, for example. I mean, yeah, it's just basically. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I just realized that I'm actually going quite uh, quite slow, right? And I haven't even reached the, the, the closed loop. <laughs> but uh, to be honest, I mean, at this point, if you have already gotten more or less of this part, uh, the, the, the closed loop is actually relatively simple once you spend some time doing this. Uh, now, all of this is basically about how to deal with the, with the robustness in terms of the state constraints, right? So I, I want to satisfy constraints. So how do we do this? If I have some inequality constraint, of course, my robustified constraint is basically, uh, if, if it's a path constraint, just maximizing over the current ellipsoid, right? So over, over the time varying, uh, over the tube, basically, at, at each time, point in time. Uh, simplest thing, if I have linear state constraints, then basically the robustified constraints, I, I can compute it exactly because I know how to compute support functions, right? So I have exact expressions for the support functions, and these are just merely support functions, right? So for linear constraints, it's, it's very simple to do this. It's the same thing if, if, I have, if I have bounds, right? I just basically take, uh, um, I just take unit vectors in, in the directions of the, in the coordinate directions. And, uh, and then basically I just get my, my bounds, right? So all of this is, is, is if, if you have linear constraints, basically you know how to do this because you know how to compute support functions. That's it. Now, if you have, um, yeah, basically that, that, that's for the linear constraints. I haven't really talked about nonlinear constraints. Nonlinear constraints, if, uh, if uh, you cannot do anything better, uh, the, main, the, the thing that you would do is basically uh, do the same thing as you do with the right-hand side. Just split into a linear and nonlinear part, and then, uh, and then uh, you know how to deal exactly with the linear part. And then basically um, you, you're, adding, um, you're adding the support function of the, of the other ellipsoid, right? So you consider it at, 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 uh, as, a, as an uncertainty as, as, as well. Uh, if there is nothing better you can do for this, right? Um, now, let's look again to, to our exothermic reaction, uh, reactor. So I have all of my states, and then basically they have to be included in my, in my ellipsoid. So I have uh, three, uh, three states, and then I have to add these hyperstates. So, you know, so basically the components of my matrix. I can reduce the number because I know that, uh, that my matrix has to be symmetric, so I can just propagate the, the one of the triangular parts. Uh, my uncertainties are in some ellipsoid over here as well. Um, let's just uh, recap. I have my dynamics, and then I can construct. So, so I can construct uh, basically the, the, the nominal part. Then the the um, a dynamic equation for the for the shape matrix. And you know, just for 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 to make it simple, I can um, I will just basically compute Jacobians and then just evaluate at the central path, right? So I can do all of this. Simply, I don't need anything special at this point except the nonlinearity estimate. But apart from that, I, I, I don't need anything special. Now, in terms of the constraints, basically I have this. Uh, I have my safety constraint, right? So I'm maximizing with respect to to. I can just maximize with respect to the bounds, right? In the current ellipsoid. Um, and then my control problem is to find u, lambda, and kappa such that I can maximize uh, uh, at the terminal time my conversion, right? Then I think I went really, really, uh, really slow. But anyways, so um, for this constraint, basically, it's relatively simple because uh, I know I, I have monotonicity, so I can basically compute at which point of the bounds will, uh, I, I can evaluate basically this, uh, the, 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 the maxima for this expression, right? Just basically to show some, uh, some results, these are my bounds, right? This is the central path. I can minimize the open loop, con uh, I, can, I can do basically the open loop control, and I will guarantee that, my, that, uh, that if I implement this uh, open loop control, basically no constraint will be violated. This is just the, the, the Monte Carlo simulation for, uh, for the, with the open loop controls. Uh, as you can see, I mean, there is, it's, it's conservative, right? So, so I cannot, I don't manage to basically touch the constraint. And um, 
I have a performance loss of 32%. How do I evaluate this performance loss? Loss, I basically, um, for this system, I know exactly what my worst case, where my worst case will happen, right? So I can basically compute, I can do some sort of perfect information oracle in order to know. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I really have time to, to, to go through the, through the closed loop one. Um, but the whole idea is basically that, um, the whole idea is that now I'm just gonna consider uh, um, reachable sets with respect to, 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 uh, to feedback loss, right? So instead of doing it for, for open loop controls, I do it for feedback loss. And uh, the main idea is to change a little bit of, uh, of the paradigm. One thing that I can do is say like, look, let's look at uh, specific types of feedback loss. Let's look at a fine feedback loss, for example, right? And, um, uh, and this is, uh, if, you, if you have seen like tube MPC methods, this is most, uh, most of, uh, most of uh, what they do, is just uh, restrict the search over feedback loss, and then try to construct these reachable tubes, basically using linear feedback loss. Uh, you can change a little bit the, the paradigm and then just ask for a different parameterization. So basically using robust forward invariant tubes, which is just saying, I want the, I'm looking for a set valid function such that there exists a feedback law. And this whole expression tells me that if I start inside of the tube, right? So there exists a feedback law that will keep me inside of the tube. That's all he's saying. Uh, and again, I mean, in this, if I use this definition, the feedback law is implicit. It's implicit in the definition of Y. Uh, this is basically, I mean, I can, if I know how to characterize my, my robust forward invariant tubes, I know how to, how to write a tube MPC, uh, a tube MPC method. Uh, and the whole point is to try to find computationally tractable characterizations of the, of the robust invariant tube. And surprise, uh, I use basically a min max differential inequality. Before I told you, I have, I give you, uh, I give you an open loop control and then you compute reachable sets. Now I'm telling you that if I just minimize my support function over the set of controls, right? This is a, this is a sufficient condition such that my set valued function is a robust forward invariant tube. It's, uh, again, if I look at the lips, it's everything becomes a little bit simpler, but uh, 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 this was in, um, this is basically an automatic paper in 2017. And um, if you remember more or less, basically this is what I had before, right? So at some point I had this expression without the, uh, for, the for the open loop reachability, I had this expression which are, which are the, without the minimization here, right? The way I show that this is actually true is by constructing some feedback law. Uh, I just take the argument of the minimum basically here, and then I compute, so this is a function of C, and then I know, if I know how to go basically, this, this map over here allows me to go from points in the boundary of the unit circle to points in the boundary of the, of the, of the ellipsoid. This map is actually invertible, and this is basically what I get here, right? So I can go from points in the boundary to points in the boundary of the unit sphere. I plug it in, and then I basically apply the normal differential inequality to show that this is indeed true, that there exists one feedback law, right? Now, in terms of construction, I basically do the same tricks, and then you end up having most of the same terms except that this now, that the, that the linear part basically, it's, it's some sort of closed loop matrix. Again, this is just trying to go through all of the steps of the, of the construction, right? And I must remark that this is not the same, this, this is not the same as you're saying that my, that I will construct uh, an open loop ellipsoidal tube using a affine feedback law. Right? I mean, this may look the same because I decided to use the same K over here, but this is actually not the same. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I, we haven't tried to show basically whether this is, uh, this is equivalent, but the construction basically uses 
a non-trivial, non-trivial, non-linear feedback law. Um, you need to have some uh, now some control constraints, and this is basically one explicit feedback law that I can get from here. Right? I can construct this feedback law, and I know that this feedback law. This has to be an equal sign here. But I know that now if I have my tube, and then if I take any point inside of this tube, and then I apply, I generate my closed loop system using this feedback law, then I will remain inside of the tube. Uh, then basically, I construct this problem. Um, just wanted to, to look at this again. I have the same, I added uh, uh, extra degrees of freedom here and here, and now I have more degrees of freedom here, right? Now, how is, just, just basically to finalize with this, just to, just to finalize with this, this whole construction is a feedback construction because I'm optimizing, I'm, I'm, I'm having here and now conditions, so point-wise in time conditions, but these point-wise in time conditions, they already know that I will be able to optimize in the future. So this is a feedback, a feedback tube. It's different from the feedback, uh, from, from the open loop uh, tube. And I can still write it as a standard optimal control problem. All of these problems, uh, we solve them using a, a Kado toolkit. You can use your favorite, uh, your favorite uh, uh, um, uh, optimal control software. Um, I can show you some of the code that basically uh, uh, the PhD student wrote, but uh, I mean, you know how to write these ODEs, you know how to write these constraints explicitly, then basically you can put it in an optimal control. So you can, solving an open loop optimal control problem will give you a feasible solution for your closed loop, for your, for your min max feedback optimal control problem that I showed you in the beginning. Now, uh, I have some bounds here, and then again, this is my Monte Carlo. This Monte Carlo, we got it using the explicit feedback law. Right? So there is no MPC in here. So this is the initial tube that I got by solving one optimal one tube optimal control problem from, from time zero to time two. Um, and then just applying the, the, the basically the, um, the explicit feedback law. Right? And in here I have a performance loss of 27%, which is less than the open loop expected. Uh, and this one, it, uh, it was running for 10 hours, but this was, was in, in, in MPC mode. So instead of using the explicit feedback law, at every time I take the, the first element of the nominal, of the nominal uh, 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 control, right? And then I implement it. So it's just basically, again, uh, it, it's just a tube MPC uh, scheme. Uh, there are no tubes in here because basically this is just like the, the, the Monte Carlo uh, trajectories. And for this one, at two hours, I have a, a, a performance loss of 22% uh, and 24% uh, uh, if I leave it run for, for 10 hours. And then basically, I'm just going to finish with here, with this. Uh, I hope that uh, at least I have shown you that uh, you can start with something which is very complex. You can start with this horribly looking, robust, optimal feedback control problem. And uh, you can, at the cost of some conservatism, basically, you can arrive to, a, to tractable formulations, to formulations that you can actually write in an optimal control software. I'm not claiming that it's easy to, 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 to write them down. I'm not claiming that it's easy to solve them. I'm just claiming that these can be formulated as standard optimal control problems, right? Um, of course. Uh, one of the things that I, I must mention is that all of the methods that I showed you, they are valid not only for parameters, but also for time-varying disturbances. So nothing changes once I add, uh, basically, time-varying disturbances. These methods do not, they, uh, they, grow, they grow polynomially with the, the time horizon, right? They do not explode in terms of, they do not scale with the disturbance, right? So this not, doesn't grow with the disturbance. Uh, with the number of disturbances. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's uh, to be honest, quite important to say, because I mean, some methods are exponential. Uh, yeah, so sorry, with that, um, no, no, with that, uh, I will finish. I mean, uh, if you are interested, just want to say, if you're interested, we have uh, we basically been using this in the group for to solve different kind of problems. We have some, uh, uh, use some uh, real-time tube MPC at a microsecond level for a quadrocopter. 
some uh, time optimal uh, maneuvers for robot arms carrying glass plates, uh, uh, periodic uh, chemical bioprocesses. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you know, I can basically show you all of this uh, later on some of the details if you want. We would like to thank you yeah. for an enlightening workshop. So let's thank you.